William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. There's a place somewhere, folks, away from the hurly-burly, where everything is slow and easy, and you can sleep around the clock without being heckled. I could be referring to a cemetery. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. speaking. On call like I am as a confidential investigator, the open door, come one, come all, you don't always get cases that run according to Hoyle. Every once in a while, you catch yourself a Lulu, a case that puts a strain on your imagination. A case, say, in the category of a spookaroo. (laughs) You find yourself hobnobbing with ghosts and talking turkey to the dead. One like that began for me in the New York office of the Trans-Southern Insurance Company of Omaha. I'd been urgently requested to come calling, please, by a claims agent named Brenahan, Roy C. Brenahan. I'll explain the assignment we have for you, Craig. Before you do, answer me this. What's with your regular investigators? Why pull an outsider in? Well, we want this investigated unofficially. Mm. We, we don't want to stir up anything that will expose us to a libel suit. I catch. In case you're pulling a boner that's a butte, uh, harassing innocent people. Yes. What's the story? Our file number, 15466. Uh, double indemnity case, now officially closed. We paid out $50,000 to the widow of a subway accident victim named Remo Torch. Well, this was 90 days ago. So? I'll now play you a recording I secretly made of an anonymous telephone call I was party to yesterday. Now, listen carefully, Craig. Hello. Hello, Mr. Roy Brenahan, please. This is Roy Brenahan speaking. I've got some information for you. Yes? Your company paid a $50,000 claim to a Mrs. Remo Torch three months ago. You remember it? Of course, sir. Uh, Remo Torch fell to his death off a subway platform. What about it? The claim was a fraud. It wasn't Remo Torch who fell under a train. But his widow identified the body. The identification was false. Uh, who are you? A friend. Goodbye. Uh, Mr. Wait, don't hang up. Identify yourself and there's a bonus. But uh, my anonymous caller hung up, Craig, without identifying himself. I thought about it overnight, and today I called you in. Oh, it could be a crank call or an envious relative with a weird sense of humor. You must get a thousand crackpot telephone calls. Yes, we do. We can't ignore them. Even if there's the smallest possibility of... Of recovering a paid-out claim. Yeah, I've heard about insurance claims agents, the fanatical watchdogs you fellows get to be... You're hoping and praying I turn up a scheming widow and proof that a third party was pushed off that subway platform and the corpse palmed off on you as Remo Torch. Uh, Handle this delicately as if we have nothing to do with it, like it's a case of your own. I can't be too delicate about exhuming a body. I need to get a court order for that. So do you want to get yourself another boy? No, I'll stick with you, Craig. Or be stuck with me. Ten percent, Branahan. Any monies I recover for good old Trans-Southern, earmark 10% for Barry Craig. While waiting for red tape to unravel on the court order for exhumation of a corpse, I went to see the scheming widow. 169 Seneca Street was her last known address, a street where the drunks outnumbered everybody else. I ran into a very curious development at 169 Seneca. No widow torch. The janitor, who looked like his mind wandered, explained the widow's absence. Widow torch is dead. A dead policyholder and a dead, though rich, beneficiary. 
I had quite a cast of live suspects. The next evening, I drove myself to the Hillcrest Cemetery on Sycamore Street out in Long Island, where the mangled remains of Remo Torch had been buried. I had a signed court order okaying exhumation to serve on the caretaker there, an old geezer named Sam Billings. Going through the big iron gate, I heard the night chimes. Night is a nice time to go calling on a graveyard if you hate yourself. Every superstition you had as a kid comes back to haunt you. You begin to see things and hear things. Going up a narrow path toward the caretaker's house, I heard things. A scream as if somebody was being murdered not 50 yards away. I got to the scream. It was the old caretaker Billings on the ground near an open grave and a dead faint. Caretaker came too, Popeye, as if he'd seen the devil and clawing at me as if no. I was the devil. No. Quit it, no. Billings. No. no, go away. Keep choking no. me and I'll have to flatten you. <laughs> I'm Barry Craig, a confidential investigator, now concentrating on insurance. Now, if you can collect your wits, old man. You're an investigator. Who'd you think I was? Him. Him? Who? The reason dead. Makes sense, old man. I was making my rounds like every night. And I heard a noise. A noise I'll never forget if I live to be a hundred. The odds are away against you, the hypertension you've got. I turned to look, bringing my light close. And it was the lid of a coffin coming off, as if by itself. Neatest trick of the century. And then what happened? I lived to be a... We've husband. already been through that. Then the dead man got up and stood there, alive as you're standing here, all green under the moon. How does the rest of the hallucination go? I watched him go off, not making a sound, and walking in a funny little hop, and then... You screamed and fainted dead away. The next thing you knew, you had your fingernails in my neck. Now get your bearings and throw a light on that coffin. I want to have a look. See, the casket is empty. Empty it is. So a stiff came to, forced the lid open, turned green under the moon, and then went on the town. It's something to believe, but I saw it with my own eyes. But that 2020 vision you don't have, did you also see who dug him up? Dug him up? That's what I asked, if you'll really open your eyes. Six feet of dirt piled in two neat hills on both sides of the grave, see it? Yes. To get out from under, your stiff needed a muscular accomplice on the outside. Who was supposed to be buried in that grave? I can't make out the name on the tombstone. Torch. Remote Torch. The case was coming to life, but literally. I left caretaker Billings to sleep off his jitters and got into my car. Driving down tree-shaded Sycamore Street, my headlights picked up a character moving along the sidewalk in a funny little hop. A funny little hop were exactly the words the caretaker had used describing his stiff who'd come alive. My man on the sidewalk was loping along like that, a kind of hop, skip, like a guy who had no control over his reflexes. I switched from brights to dims, slowed the car down to a crawl, and trailed him into a tavern, a big neon sign advertised as Bond Stable Inn. I went in after him. My man wasn't after eats or bottle goods. He was out to make a phone call. I watched him thumb through a directory, then get into a booth. As soon as it was safe, I eased into the adjourning booth to hear what I could hear. I must see you. At once, tonight. Well, you must come. In Burnside Park, near the fun. I'll be there waiting for you. I watched him start for the open door of the tavern. I checked the phone directory where he'd left it open and read off the name where his fingernail had left a line under it. Mrs. Verna Talbot, it said. 2580 Marydale Drive. <laughs> a guy risen from the dead was dating a woman. <laughs> I was right there in Burnside Park in a grandstand seat behind a row of bushes when they met. 
My man was hanging off to his side as if he wasn't really meeting the woman, but ambushing her. I could hear her high heels clicking toward him. Hello, Mary. Look, Mary. You're calling me Mary? Yes. You're not who you said you were on the telephone. No, I'm not. It was a ruse to get you to come. I'll come out of the shadows so you can see my face. Well? Your face is chalk. It's a dead face. And your eyes... They're dead eyes, Mary. I've been dead, but I've come back. I've come back to claim you, Mary. Mary, my wife. Oh, you're insane. Uh, I'm not your Mary or your uh, wife. I don't even know you. Let me go. Uh, he wasn't just claiming her. He was strangling her. I got busy. Let go of her, mister. Uh, oh. Suppose we postpone introductions for later. Oh. <laughs> might have been risen from the dead, but he reacted to the old one, too, like anybody else. He was out cold, stiff, like Rigor Mortis had come back. While he slept it off, I revived the dame and questioned her. I'm Barry Craig, an investigator, madam. I'd like a few honest facts and no ad-libbing. Remember, I probably just saved your life. I'm grateful. The man is insane. You acted as if you didn't know him. I never saw him before in my life. He's allegedly a Remo Torch. He said he'd come back from the dead. So far as we know right now, could be. If you don't know the man at all, why did you agree to meet him here? He telephoned me and said he was Tom Avery. I've known a Tom Avery. Your name is Mrs. Verna Talbot? Why, yes. How did you know? Never mind how. You live with your husband? Yes, I do. But he mustn't know I came here to meet Tom Avery. Jealous? Y yes. We get along badly, my husband and I. We're together, but we live separate lives. Oh. May I please go now? Sure. I don't see why not. I watched her melt into the night, half mink, half woman. And I sat down to rest up, take stock, and wait. <laughs> I'd sure find myself a bright way of making a living. There I was in a public park at 2 a.m., waiting for a corpse to rise for the second time in one night. This time out of dreamland. Remo Torch, or whoever he really was, slowly came out of the dreamland I'd rocked him into. He got up on his feet, rubbing his jaw where I'd clipped him. With a wild gleam in his eye and his teeth showing, as if he were getting set to jump me, I threw a gun on him fast. Don't try anything, Torch, or I'll prove to you that dead men bleed. Gonna do what I say, nice and cooperatively? I'll do what you say. My car's outside the park. We'll get into it and drive to my apartment. To your apartment? For a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Shake your head and I turn you over to the cops. It's all the choice you've got right now. Me or the cops. I'll go with you. I got him home with me, okay, and put him to bed. When he fell asleep, I handcuffed him to the bed and tied his feet. And I showered and waited for daylight in a good morning chat with Lieutenant Trev Rogers at Willie's Coffee Pot. I don't get half of what you've told me, Craig. Half's enough to hold you for now. Feed ghost stories to little boys a spoonful at a time, an old teacher of mine used to say. Just you run down a few items I asked, huh, pal? You want me to find out when a Mary Torch died? And who signed the death certificate, and where was she buried? Phone me the minute you know. Uh, Craig. Yeah? Being your blind helper, just how did I get so degraded? <laughs> the coffee's my treat. Have yourself a second cup, chum. Torch was wide awake when I got back from Trav Rogers. I untied his feet, but kept the handcuffs on. All recovered from your busy night, Torch? What do you want with me? I'll settle for the story of your life. 
I can only remember the story of my death. I died August 28, 1951. Okay, I'll play straight man. Go ahead and tell me the story of your death. My last day alive was a Friday. After breakfast, I left home and my wife, Mary, to take a subway train downtown. In the subway, the express platform was crowded, as it always was. But waiting for my train, I could feel one man closest to me. Why this one man? He went everywhere I went. What did he look like? Seeing him was like looking into a mirror and seeing myself. He uh, resembled you? This man who was always behind me was a man with my face. Oh, go on. He was behind me, this man with my face. A train was coming in. I heard its warning sound, and then I saw it come at me, hissing like an iron dragon with enormous eyes that held me spellbound. I tried to push back, but hands threw me forward, forward into the jaws of the iron dragon. No! That's how I died, August 28th, three months ago. You don't believe the story of my death? When I do, peddle me to Bellevue. That's how you were supposed to have died August the 28th last. That's the phony story in the Trans-Southern Insurance Files. You were supposed to have died like that, Torch, only you didn't. Somebody else did. Somebody else did? Yeah. The patsy whose remains were identified as Remo Torch. The poor devil who was really in that coffin you supposedly stepped out of last night. Excuse me. Barry Craig speaking. Barry, this is Trav Rogers. Mary Torch died a month ago, a heart attack, and Eric Carter signed the death certificate. She was buried in Hillcrest Cemetery like her husband before her. I got it. Thanks, Trav. Can I be of any further service to you? Yeah, you can. Send one of your boys over to my apartment. I've got a prize package I want under lock and key while I roam the world. habit. There I was again at Hillcrest Cemetery, waving another court order at old caretaker Billings, this time with the name Mary Torch spelled out on it. Old Billings read the court order, sneaking a little foolish grin at me as he read. Used to be an order, Mr. Craig. Can you round up a couple of diggers right away? They can build Trans-Southern for the labor. It's easy to do. For a guy hoodooed by the risen dead last night, you're looking mighty cheerful today. I'll bet a tombstone you solved the mystery of the empty coffin for yourself. You're a discerning man, Mr. Craig. You found a body somewhere. The body the real Remo Torch sneaked out of that coffin before he got into it. In time for you to come along and get an eyeful. I'm right, huh? You're right. And I'm a foolish old man. Where'd you find the body that was buried as Remo Torch? Not 20 feet from where we're standing. Show me. Right here, by those flower beds it was. Very shallow. Flowers had been tramped on, and I went to investigate. I saw the dirt had been turned over fresh, and then I noticed a foot. A foot sticking... Cut. Leave something to my imagination. Now go round up those diggers. Slab of marble read Mary Torch. Two beefy gents were digging her up. They wore a look on their kisses that said they just loved to make an argument of it. They were the same team who'd buried the Mary Torch coffin only a month ago. To them, I was some creep on doing a work of art. Me and my court order. You've got the coffin exposed enough, men. Now use the crowbar on it. I soon got a look at the contents of the coffin. No. Body, Mr. Craig. The casket's full. Full as the word, Billings. Full of rocks. The answer to the rocks was obvious. Mary Torch's death was a phony and ditto a burial. 
I found out how it was maneuvered by an entry in the cemetery record book. It's uh, the name of the undertaker you want? Or whoever supervised the so-called burial. Uh, here it is. Mary Torch. And Eric Carter supervised the burial. Does the name mean something to you? Does it? Eric Carter's the same joker who also signed the phony medical certificate. The great insurance swindle and how it was accomplished began to stitch into one piece. I had almost all the answers, enough answers anyhow, to parlay into a climax. Only somebody was working his own idea of a climax, a climax to Barry Craig. I'd left Hillcrest through the big iron gates for the drive back to Manhattan. I switched on the ignition. Good thing the cemetery was convenient to call the fuss and bother out of my burial. getting a whack at the trick myself. I was dragging toward a light, a light no bigger than an arrowhead, waiting for me somewhere at the end of a long sleep. And bells, bells tolling morning. Morning, the bells were saying. Now wake up, Craig. Wake up. Craig, look at me. And the voice, the face, the face of someone I'd seen around the trail. Rogers, how did you come to die, Trev? I didn't, and neither did you, the miracle is. You're in Shaw Park Hospital, in emergency. Huh. Huh. A time bomb... Hook to your starter cable. Step on the car starter and blow yourself up. A gimmick with whiskers. A long gray beard. It's an old murder device, moth-eaten, but they got you, Craig. How bad am I? You're one for Ripley. I'm okay? Is that what you mean? Just lacerations of the head and neck. Shock. You're wearing more bandages than King Tut. You're also minus an automobile. I'll build Trans Southern. Trail, get me out of here. I want Remo Torch back. As soon as I'm dressed, he and I are going bye bye. I taxied Remo Torch across town to an address in my little black book 2580 Meridale Drive. I'm reuniting you with the lady you made a scene over last night, Torch. Yes, you. Us. May we come in? Uh, but... You remember Remo Torch? Well, yes, of course. After last night, could I forget? I guess not. Especially since he only tried to strangle you. It'd be even harder to forget him if you were his wife. His wife? I'm Verna Talbot. My husband is George Talbot, a manufacturer's representative. Hooray for employment. Is your husband around? Yes. Introduce him to us. Very well. George! Yes, Werner? This is my husband, Mr. Craig. That's him. Oh, him, Torch, him who? The man with my face. It's my murderer, my murderer. Get this mad man off me. Torch, Stop. no more of that. Let go of him. My apologies for my friend's behavior, Talbot. There does seem to be a superficial resemblance between you. Same general features, sort of. Nonsense. This man's plainly insane. Insane like a fox. I'd say Torch has a pretty shrewd idea of what he's up to. I'd even say he was trying to drive a couple of schemers crazy before the law caught up with them. I don't understand the thing you're saying, Mr. Uh... Craig. Craig. All Greek to you, huh? Suppose I spell it out and you see if you get the drift. Torch's wife had him marked for murder. The lady wanted to cash in his insurance and then marry her boyfriend and Eric Carter. The boyfriend began following poor Torch around. 
waiting for a chance to knock him off. But Torch caught on to what was cooking and figured out a way of outsmarting the schemers. Drop the insanity post, Torch, and tell him how you did it. I uh, hired an unemployed bit actor to wear my clothes and play it being me. You... The actor came down the steps of Torch's house every morning, stopped at the same newsstand, then went into the subway to ride to his office, as Torch would. Am I right on that, Torch? Yeah. The device worked. You fell for it, Talbot, because you'd never actually met Remo Torch. Did you say I fell for it? I said just that. You pushed a stooge hired by Torch under that train. Madam here identified what was left of the stooge and collected her 50000 But Torch was really alive and kicking all the time. How much does it take to coax a confession out of you, Mr. Eric Carter, alias Talbot? Or you, Mrs. Torch? We're caught, Eric. Are we, Mary? I rather think I have our little problem very much under control. Keep your hands as they are, Craig. No good, Carter. How far do you think a gun's going to get you? Oh, I told you we'd lose, Eric. Stop whining, you fool. Face it, Carter. The lady wants out. The way it's stacking, I'll bet she turns state's evidence. Now, drop that gun. Get back, Craig. I said drop it. Thank you, crazy fool. Let go, my... Oh. When you shoot somebody, Carter, be sure you keep possession of the gun. Craig, I, I didn't mean to shoot you. It was an accident in the struggle for the gun. Craig, don't shoot me. Tit for tat. In a minute, I'm going to pass out. I don't want you on the loose when I do. Tit for tat in the leg. Just enough to make you stay put. Craig, no. (laughs) Torch. Yes, Craig. Call police headquarters. Rogers. Lieutenant... Trav Rogers. Wake up from a long sleep and there's the same face in front of you. Like a pinup on a wall. Don't look now, Craig. But you're back in Shaw Park Hospital... Emergency. What's my medical complaint this time? Bullet in your left thigh. You'll be out in a week. And limp for a month. Oh, great. And now that you're conscious, you want to talk. Eric Carter masterminded the phony death and burial of Mary Torch. And also planted the time bomb. Uh, one minute, Craig. Yeah? You're forgetting you played the case very close to the vest. That you so far only told me about half of it. Oh, oh, that makes the conclusions I'm giving you a little puzzling. A little incomprehensible. How long did you say I lay over here? A week. Pull up a bed, Trav. Pull up a bed? I got a long story to tell you. As a conscientious officer of the law, I know you want to hear it. (laughs) Weak as I feel, and long as the story is, I figure it will take about a week to tell. Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Three times mean good times on NBC.